10 years at this point. I'm getting, getting up there, you can see the gray hair sort of coming in. Not so much Jack. Uh, um, <laughs> Uh, and so sort of one of the big things that's kind of come out of that experience has been really my, my focus on cooperatives. You know, and I've been thinking about this, especially with the left libertarian approach, and you know, we're hearing a little bit about this anti-politics. Um, there's a certain, you know, there's, there's a question of, okay, what, what sorts of institutions can lead to liberatory outcomes? And the, the quick and dirty sort of version of why I see co-ops in general, and so this will sort of, my presentation is going to cover kind of two parallel sort of tracks. One, specifically looking at co-ops and sort of the effectiveness and usefulness of organizing kind of a group of a consumer co-op, which uh, myself and uh, these five folks over here, who came down to from Vermont, have been involved in. Um, but also sort of kind of some practices and rituals around just home brewing that can be useful for any kind of organizing group. Um, so the quick and dirty on the sort of analysis of cooperatives and the sort of role that they have is that you know, for the most part, a lot of most people in our society are kind of making their living, um, especially sort of in, in the first world, making their living uh, in some way related to the to the state. Um, you know, you're either you know directly work for it, work for a contractor that's funded by it, work for a nonprofit that's funded by it. Especially in the post-industrial economy, um, you have this great mass of people for whom that is their primary source of, of revenue, and. So, so there's this question of when you're looking at kind of the intrusiveness of the regulatory state and sort of how it kind of limits people's autonomy. Um, the, the question of how do you actually get people sort of exposed and bought in directly to sort of the restraints that are put on that. If you're sort of working in sort of a wage relationship job where you, where you are not the owner of the sort of productive assets, uh, you, you really sort of don't have a direct feedback loop with the regulatory structure. In fact, the feedback loop can be positive. You know, raise the minimum wage and you, know, you have more money and more time and more autonomy for yourself if you're at the bottom of the spectrum. Um, however, so, the, so what, what co-ops did do is by, by distributing ownership broadly, it brings a lot of people who otherwise have little to no property rights in the economy, um, it gives them a piece of an enterprise that then can enter into that if that ultimately if one of the main functions of the state is to sort of uh, buttress and sort of augment the accumulation of capital um, by sort of those who already have a lot of it, um, you know, rent seeking, etc. Then sort of the co-ops can be this kind of moment where people can see, okay, well, if this is something, whether it's a food co-op or a brewing co-op, whatever it is that they're personally investing volunteer energy, time, money into, um, and it runs into problems with the state, suddenly you have a much bro a broad base that can be mobilized on that particular issue. And it can kind of inform your, it can, it's, can be seen as almost a mass education tool for informing people's relationship with the state and the state's kind of constraints on, on their own. Um, so, the, um, so, so really, so again, there's kind of these sort of two um, parallel, parallel pieces of, that, are, that are kind of important in this. Um, the, fir the first is um, kind of thinking about the challenge of organizing general. No matter what your group is, you know, you get a group of people, they've got a specific issue or a sort of specific ideology. Um, and having been through many of these myself, and I'm sure most people in this room have as well, um, there's often an issue about kind of, there, there are lots of issues that emerge about trying to sort of take a group of people and get them to trust each other, have a sense of each other's competencies and weaknesses so that it can be predictable as to, you know, who's going to follow through on stuff, who is, who is skilled at what, who's not, who's reliable. It takes time, sort of, especially if you have a single issue affinity, it takes time to learn that about the other people you're working with. Um, and. You know, it's, and then there's the other pieces, oftentimes in these projects that are very focused on a particular goal. Um, it's work. You know, it's the sort of thing where we all have busy lives, our lives have a lot of things going on. And, you know, it's something where it's like, is one more meeting in, in my week going to be something that I can really afford to put my energy into if I'm having to work 40 or 50 hours a week to make all of my bills? and spend some time, you know, renewing my personal relationships that are essential, you know, keeping my, my mental health and physical health in place. You pile all those things on and there's really, for most people, a very limited amount of time that's really available for them to sort of engage in resistance work. Um, and, I don't know, you know, you can probably think of other challenges that 
that you've run, you've run into in various groups and in various kind of organizing projects that really sort of make it difficult to sort of put in the time necessary to then build that trust with people and build that mutual understanding that can actually make you an effective group rather than, you know, a circular pitching session. Um, so there's a great book um, by, a, by a sociologist named Richard Sennett. It's called, uh, the title is Together, The Rituals, Pleasures, and Politics of Cooperation. Um, the, the title is a little, a little heavy, but I would highly recommend it. It really gets into a lot of these issues of how groups work together, how trust is built. And for me, one of the key takeaways from, from Senate's kind of perspective um, is that one of the most powerful ways of building trust and thereby group cohesion and effectiveness is shared work. And that work doesn't have to be directly related to the goal, the, the sort of the, the purpose that brings people together, but, but sort of toward, in, the, in the immediate term, but really the, 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 the outcome of that kind of cohesion itself is a, um, is a good that then makes the group more effective in advancing its goal. And so given that, small-scale brewing really is a powerful and useful project for a number of reasons for, for, for groups to undertake as a way for sort of achieving this cohesion, trust, and capacity. And um, in Senate's book, he has a little uh, quote from Saul Alinsky, uh, which is, you know, booze is, booze is the organizer's most important tool. And so, you know, so, so there's a couple of reasons that this is really a useful, um, this is something that can be a really powerful, powerful tool for groups. And I mean, the first is simply, you know, the presence of, if you're brewing consistently, the presence of a, you know, moderate amount of alcohol at meetings, um, first of all, signals to group members that this isn't purely work. Because if people are thinking, okay, you know, there, we have this, I have this personal time, I have limited personal time, some of it needs to be spent in some recuperative, relaxing ways in which I feel kind of better and recharged after, and other things are going to be spent in work. The presence of a little bit of alcohol in the event kind of signals that there's sort of both going on. You can be productive, but it's also a space to relax, a space to, you know, be in communion with others, um, and can be fun. It's a pleasure, camaraderie, etc. So just the very fact that you're sort of doing that, sort of having that be a, be a part of the fabric of the rituals of your community, is um, is itself useful. Uh, but I mean, you can also do that by buying a third rack of beer and sticking it in the corner. You know, so so why brew? You know, why take the energy to do that? Um, kind of, as I, as I mentioned with Senate's book, the second piece is really sort of building trust and community through the shared work. You know, you, there's various levels of brewing. You know, you could be you know boiling pots for you know hours full of grains, extract you know, or you could use use um, already extracted things, or you could do something as simple as, and this is something that um, I'll get into an example more specifically, just doing a gallon of cider every meeting. Um, get cider that doesn't have preservatives in it, you pour it in a carboy, you throw some yeast in it, put something on there, let it ferment for a while, and, you know, a few more steps in there, but pretty simple, you know, like something that maybe like there's an hour or half an hour of work. Um, and so, so, so the, 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 the work process itself gives all the participants a chance to um, get a sense of how each other work, you know, like what are, what are your skills, like are you someone who's reliable, especially because, you know, you know, if you're thinking about, the, you know, groups that are often engaged in more serious resistance work, direct action, and stuff like that, it's really important to kind of have that, have a low, lower stakes situation where there is a desired outcome, it requires people to sort of rely on each other, to sort of respect time frame, timetables, to do certain tasks, and kind of having something like this that has an output that's community benefiting anyway is a great way of sort of doing that work. Um, it also sort of gives participants a chance, and this is another powerful thing for building that cohesion, it kind of creates a gift economy environment. So the people who put their time into the, um, into a particular portion of the process, that's a gift from them to this kind of larger community, organizing community. People who, the person who shows up with a gallon of cider that's going to get fermented, you know, they spent five bucks at the grocery store for that. And again, that's a gift to the community where this goes through this process where multiple people are putting their work and their energy and their resources into it. And so when the product comes out, then there's appreciation for many people in the community who contribute to it. And that sort of sense of communication, that sort of sense of small gift giving, the gift economy element to this, can kind of really create a powerful, um, a, pow a powerful series of opportunities for people to sort of learn to appreciate each other more. Um, and a, fi a final thing that's really sort of um, you know, simple and intuitive, but actually very powerful, is 
what I decided to call here yeast-based scheduling. So, like, one of the things with, with organizing groups is that, you know, when you want to have consistent meetings, it's very easy to lose momentum. Have a meeting, have something really productive, and then there's no follow-through. Um, and what the brewing process does, especially if you're kind of consistently making it a certain amount, is it has these certain points where something needs to be done, you know. The, the thing needs to be moved from primary to secondary fermentation. The thing need, needs to be moved from secondary fermentation into the bottles. The bottles need to be aged for a month. So you have these milestones in the process that then can basically function as, um, as your points of meeting. Because if, if people need to come together to get that work done, then they can also come together to get all this other work done. And it's the sort of thing where you can then also sort of have the... Um, you know, have the, have the product of this be something that's, again, only consumed when that process is happening. So that that becomes a motiv another motivation where it's like, oh, it's a Thursday night, should I go out to the bar over there? Or, oh, they're, they're going to have cider and they're gonna be, we're going to be making beer and we'll be working on this thing. It's something that, you can, that makes this more appealing for your recreational time. Um, and so I'll give kind of two examples of this. One, of, um, one is kind of this question of, you know, the, the far simpler one that's widely applicable, which is, Brewing is an organizational enhancement ritual. Um, and then the second one will be kind of brewing as an end, which is the sort of question of, okay, starting this kind of cooperative brew kind of institution. Um, so the, the example, the sort of concrete example I'll give for the, for the first one is um, the Hacker Space out of Hard Oats. In Burlington, Vermont, it's called Laboratory B. We've got about 35 members. We um, have community people working on all sorts of things. Yeah, very classic kind of chaos computer, computer club derived hacker space model. Um, and the so what we and we have a monthly meeting where there's basically a board that's a paper board. All major decisions are made by a monthly assembly of all members who want to show up. And so when thinking about hey, how do we get members to show up to this? Um, we decided to create what is now named our server rack cider, which is you know we have two basically uh, uh, two gallon glass jugs, you know, and every two weeks. You know, we come together and we sort of on our like kind of Thursday night, which is our usual um, our usual public hours, and we have you know so every other public hours, there's always a few people who are committed to make sure that they're there because they need to you know start start one batch, move one batch to the second jug, jug you know, move the second jug into into bottles and you know and then you know so these bottles accumulate and we've as a community set the rule that um, if you want to take one of these bottles. Um, at any time, if you're hanging out in the lab working on something, didn't bring some beers, and you're like, oh, I want a drink, you can go in and grab one of these 32 ounce bottles. And the, the social expectations, you put five dollars in the jar, and so that kind of creates a little like little funding thing for for the hacker space. But the only time that these beer these um, these ciders are free is at our monthly member meeting, where it's you know we have a potluck beforehand, and it's so people know when they come. It's even if you know there's always guaranteed to be a little pot of of you know cider that's been sitting in our server rack that um, is available for consumption if they come to the meeting. And so that's that kind of creates both, you know, at a few different points in the, the life of our organization, um, these opportunities for people to come together to do various pieces of the task, to learn how to do it themselves as well, and to, and to sort of, and at the, these meetings that it's, you know, there's always kind of an appreciation of the people who in the previous month they came in, put the time in to actually make this happen. Um, and so that, that principle on, you know, the smallest of a larger scale really is just so widely applicable to organizations as a way, as a just sort of way of building this ritual of production into your organizational life that kind of leads to the organization being strengthened. Um, so then the, the second piece is this kind of question of, you know, okay, rather than seeing this as kind of supplement to an, a project, putting it at the center. And as I shared my kind of analysis of the role of cooperatives, Earlier, um, it's you know one of the big issues with co-op organizing that I've found over the years is I've been involved in both kind of insurrectionary kind of governance fights within co-ops and kind of getting involved in helping start co-ops. It has been you know the question of or you generally can have a few people who are either politically motivated or sort of really into whatever the topic is if you're trying to get a co-op going who will get involved. But it's the sort of thing where a lot of people might like the idea of having one. But it's very difficult to get people to motiv motivate people to sort of put the energy in on the early end. Um, that's often only purely volunteer energy to get a co-op started. 
Um, and so drawing on that lesson, something that I kind of came to realize, a piece of analysis that I think is really interesting and is a, um, I think offers an opportunity um, for, for organizing more generally, is to think about kind of society, and I sort of, again, come from a left libertarian perspective, um, I sort of share this analysis of kind of the way capitalism functions in which its goal is to sort of extract as much as it can from the participants. Um, but at the same time, there's, you know, if it, if it sort of engages, if it engages in exploitation in a, in a too intense way, it undermines people's ability to re, kind of refresh their, their selves, to recover, to sort of maintain their health. To, to, because you, you need to, as a human being, have a certain, a certain sense of, um, you know, to, to be optimally functional so that the maximum value can be extracted from you, you need to be an, an optimally functioning human being. And that requires this kind of recovery space, and as, a, and as human beings, just the way our psychology works, that also requires certain spaces of autonomy. A pl place where we feel like we're in control, we feel like we're in the driver's seat, because otherwise you get that learned helplessness, you get depressed, you get all of these things happen. Um, and so our society basically has, like, has to, for its own sake, concede a certain rate amount of human time and energy um, into that recuperative, what I think, like to think of as a recuperative space. Um, and people are especially sort of touchy about the, the integrity and authenticity of the things they do in, in that recuperative space. They're fine with things being really alienating, really depressing, really oppressive in most of their lives. But you know, that, that weekend, that, that time they have that's supposed to be to themselves to recover is something that you know, they want to have control over. They want to have a sense of belonging to. And so that space, and so, something that actually, is, so something that really made me realize this was, um, I don't know if you, any of you kind of followed what happened, the whole Don Sterling thing. Because sports is a great example of this. It's this kind of recuperative space where people create these elaborate fantasies of control through like kind of fantasy football teams and all of this stuff that allows you to kind of have that sense of autonomy and control. Video games are another one. Um, drinking is another one. It's, it's, it's um, but so so when when that sense of you know that all of that identity investment that goes into these recuperative activities. Um, when there's a sense of betrayal, when there's kind of the veils pulled back and it's kind of shown that really, even though like, like you know, you're, what makes this so refreshing is the fact, the feeling or simulation that you're in control, there's the, um, when that veil is pulled back and it's shown that you don't, or it really doesn't reflect your values, people will react in ways where a similar disclosure outside of these recuperative spaces um, would not make a reaction because people just assume, okay, well, like, you know, as Walmart's gonna be shitty, you know, like they're gonna treat people badly. I'm not gonna get particularly angry about that because that's just how the world works. But when, you know, Don Sterling, you know, the Clippers was exposed to be, you know, a horrendous racist, suddenly all these people who had this deep identity investment, you know, in this thing that, that they spend their spare time on that, that is like a source of meaning, suddenly there's this kind of broad-based outrage. And you, we've seen a similar thing in the, in the craft beer movement where people sort of identify with beers and nerd out on it, all of that. Um, who, you know, when, when Anheuser-Busch was kind of started buying up these, these craft breweries, had similar reactions of, oh, well, this kind of sense of authenticity and this identity that I've invested in these products is, um, you know, is being betrayed by this, um, by this, like, kind of destruction of the autonomy and the character of something that I really did invest a lot of identity in. Um, and so, so that kind of level of that reaction signals to me an opening or a kind of special point of pressure point in the existing system in these recuperative spaces where people are willing to put far more energy into projects, kind of counter-economy projects that are ultimately rooted in those spaces than in ones that might, from, you know, from a kind of rational perspective, seem like more like pressure points. Like, oh, in the economy, but it, but it's because it's really ultimately a psychological reason that people put that energy in, and so um, so there's came, came this idea of the cooperative kind of brewery or brew pub. Um, the first one was opened um, in Austin, Texas, uh, owned by the consumers in 2010, called Black Star, um, and their model um, kind of it very quickly grew and now has over 3,300 members, member owners, and. It, so a number, there's about probably 20 to 30 of these projects that are kind of in various stages of formation around the country. 
Um, in Burlington, we just incorporate, we, after a year of organizing, and again, sort of using this brewing as the organizing tool. So, you know, get together once a month, brew a batch of 10 gallons of beer, drink the 10 gallons of beer that they brewed, we brewed at the last meeting, new people show up, and it's like, oh, well, you want to get involved, the worst thing that happens is you show up to a party, you drink a bunch of beer, and then you go home. Or you meet a bunch of cool people who you want to hang out with, you join a working group, whether we're talking about, you know, bylaws or brewing or, you know, business planning or whatever, but having all these places where people can kind of, who, who are brought to that space because it's a recuperative thing, and that's, that's what draws them in. Um, and then they see that, okay, well, the structure, this kind of broad-based cooperative structure kind of, from, say, the perspective of someone who likes craft beer, is a guarantee against the sort of, the, the loss of the value that, that it has to them as a, as a recuperative thing. So, you know, if Anheuser-Busch wanted to come in and buy a consumer co-op brewery, they would have to convince the majority of the people who are, um, who are involved in, who are involved in it to vote for that, rather than having a single, you know, or owner and maybe a few outside investors who can say, hey, payday, sweet, let's, you know, screw all these people who, who um, really got us to the point that we were, that we were at. Um, so, the, so the organizing process really started off as more or less a homebrew club that, um, that you know, we were getting together at people's houses once a week, kind of reach, reaching out to some other, some other area co-ops to provide support. Um, very quickly, we sort of built there was kind of a pledge drive, so people saying, okay, they pledged to pay in a $100 share when the time came. Um, but, you know, the initial sort of phase of funding was really just brew a batch of beer, pass, pass a jar around the crowd, people throw some money in, just like the bowl there. And, uh, you know, that was used to buy some grains and some propane for the next batch. Um, and so it really just kind of snowballed to the point where, sort of, you know, we were able to, you know, have 130-something people on our volunteer list. You know, this is the sort of thing, again, where it's an opportunity for this kind of broad-based political education because you have people who are coming in because it's a recuperative, enjoyable thing, but they're learning kind of to do that kind of that sort of movement, collective governance, that um, uh, learning how to kind of you know how how to how to organize and you know you really if you do it well you can kind of create all of these different opportunities for people to be involved. So rather than it just being something where someone joins like at sort of maybe a larger food co-op or a credit union and really there's only one role for the for the customer, you know, in this model there's the, one of the one of the goals really is to create a lot of different ways for people to get involved. So they not only feel ownership generally over the organization, but they also feel sort of own a special a special connection to a particular piece, whether it's um, so a few examples of, th of things that we're going to be implementing is um, you know, we have three member assemblies a year, um, and before each one, there, there's going to be a, um, a homebrew competition. You know, the home brewer brings in a batch, the members taste it, vote on it, and whichever recipe wins becomes one of the beers on tap for the next four months until the next member's assembly. Um, we're doing kind of these hops growing workshops where members learn to garden hops and then the, the co-op will then provide the market for, for those hops and we'll provide the, the rhizomes for um, hops that we know that we would particularly want. And you know, there's many other kind of ways of thinking about how to sort of take that member identity and really not think of it as this kind of, there, there's a single type of relationship but to try to build as many relationships as possible where each little subgroup that's like, that's for, for whom that's their interest and that's their connection, then that builds the loyalty to the co-op itself. And then, you know, as that grows and as that strengthens, um, it gives you opportunities to have all sorts of different direct, so, you know, member-to-member -member opportunities for, you know, mark, for kind of marketing of produce. And um, it also offers the, the opportunity to kind of suddenly, and again, this is why I was talking about at the very, very beginning of the presentation, about um, the question of how do you sort of spread this widespread understanding of how the kind of state regulatory intervention really circumscribes people's autonomy. And this is, you know, the, the, the alcohol industry is one of the most heavily regulated industries in the country um, due to the, our long-standing hangover from prohibition. Um, and the... So, so suddenly, you know, as we go through this process, and it's a group of 100 plus people who have an emotional investment in the success of this, suddenly all of those people get to experience how it is that the, the state really sort of stands in the way of this kind of these sort of mutual aid relationship that we're building together. And so, you know, one of the things that we're really kind of looking to do in the medium term in terms of strategy is once we have four, five, six hundred members all bought in and really excited about the success of the project, we look at the regulatory apparatus and we say, hey, like, here's a bunch of things that should be, you know, pushed back on, dismantled, et cetera. 
And if you can, you know, right now, when you have that kind of very narrow ownership in the brewing industry, um, even in the craft brewing industry, and oftentimes very sort of multiple layers of ownership. So you have a lot of things that, that appear to be um, craft owned, but in fact, or sort of that appear to be craft, but if you trace the ownership structure, suddenly you, you find yourself back in large concentrated Blue Moon, things. You know, that's it's B, A, B, and B, or whatever. Blue, Blue Moon is one, <laughs> is, is sort of one of the more obvious examples, but there's a number of other mechanisms that, that are used. So for instance, um, in Vermont, there's, you know, Otter Creek and Shed are both owned by Long Trail, which is owned by a Boston private equity firm for whom it's not public who actually owns them. Um, for, uh, you know, for things like the, uh, you know, the, 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 the recent Anheuser-Busch buying spree, um, you know, you have these, these uh, all these different, these, these different ownership structures, or there's actually something that's even more devious called Alchemy and Science, which is, um, run by the guy who founded Magic Hat and then sold it and got multiply sold. Um, but they basically are owned by the Boston Beer Company, and their whole role is to essentially take capital, go into particular communities, start a craft brewery that kind of has an identity that's localized, but the ownership structure is actually kind of through the shell company called Alchemy and Science, tied to one of you know the yeah, you know, one of the major conglomerates at this point, which Boston Beer Company is, you know, has had the has they had to change the definition of craft brew size-wise in order to specifically accommodate them. So, um, so, so, so the, 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 the co-op model kind of serves as a guarantee of that sort of identity and, and that and in many sectors, you know, the origins of food co-ops were um, before the regulatory state, the fact that, that consumer ownership was a way of guaranteeing the quality of a product. Um, so similarly, this is a way of guaranteeing the, you know, the sort of authenticity of, of its kind of ownership and character. Um, but you know the idea then being that if we reach the point where we have 500, 1,000 members, those members, and we run into specific regulatory hurdles, or we just develop a um, an agenda of what needs to be rolled back to make this sort of thing better, if you know we're then thinking about oh, there's another group of, group of you know in a town down the road that that wants to get started, and you know we had to go through all of this, and you know we like probably inadvertently did a whole bunch of illegal things in our first year simply because we didn't have them an exact arcane knowledge of the arcane arcana of the, the legal structure. So, you know, let's let's mobilize these five hundred members to push for, you know, to push for kind of regulatory pullbacks that will sort of allow for more of these sorts of structures to to happen. And then, you know, that question of governance and relation and the familiarity with the cooperative structure and relationship to um, to the uh, relationship to the regulatory state are all things that you know, people come into this with huge diversity of political perspectives. You know, it's not something that's, you know, that's a narrow kind of like, you know, political cult style community, but, you know, inherently the cooperative model is something that can be embraced by a wide variety of political perspectives. So it becomes this kind of place where a lot of those relations can be unpacked, but not through telling people, because unless you're sort of already a true believer, you know, most people will just tune out a political lecture, but through actually walking through that process and like having that sort of real lived experience of, um, of these relationships and tensions, and as, as someone who's then an owner and identifies as an owner and has a real stake and is not just in that kind of, you know, disenfranchised wage hand to mouth relationship. It has, I think, a pretty powerful, it's a powerful opportunity to kind of start changing consciousness around these issues. So, yeah, that's, that's my spiel, I guess. So, are there any questions or thoughts? It seems like uh, it would be, you know, obviously edgier, but one of the main power centers of the state is like public education, which is funded through the liquor sales. So if you got a you know home distilling group together, you could uh, probably cut off a lot of the state's uh, you know funding in New Hampshire locally because the, there's no income or sales tax. So almost all the state's loot is coming from property taxes, which are very hard to fight. But then the liquor monopoly is, I think, almost as much as property taxes in terms of education funding. You know? Well, and that's one of the things in this you know so from the in the first kind of like organizing tool. Yeah, totally. That's bypassing this. And then for the for the brew pub thing, it's one of those things where you do want to make where you want to actually maintain a space where people can get get to know each other, build these relationships. So you've got to have that kind of professional brewing component that is taxed by the state and under the regulatory apparatus. But the other piece is really the way that we think about it is you have this core of the professional brewers, 
And then you have this wider concentric circle of home brewers who are not sort of in competition with the with the co-op, but are actually supported by it because that's you know the source of our, our recipes, and that's the source of kind of like the co-op can act as kind of a group buying agent for input, so that reduces the cost of home brewing. And that becomes really like one of the founded like the homebrewing community um, can really be a foundational piece in, in you know it's from from the very beginning of the people who sort of make these initial parties and that sort of organizing. Once so, you have a community, then you can maybe oh you're distilling too, or oh you know a weed grower, or, like you know once the community is there. And the well, and, the, and that's yeah. the thing is that, is that this this structure because everyone if you can communicate and really be true to this idea that everyone is an owner, an equal owner, you know one member one vote. Um, then there's a lot of opportunity for people to, who have ideas about oh what what else could the co-op do, you know, and you you have these like member assemblies three times a year that in our structure are very and we, we drive this from Black Star are very empowered you know they can they can pass advisory motions so they, can, they can't actually make policy directly but they are empowered to remove board members so there's a there's you know so three times a year the members come together and if they feel like they aren't being represented they can you know it's not like you know it's not like a, it's something Something that would take years to, you know, get things back on track. Um, in the in, but it's this sort of place where that can be a forum for, hey, here's a bunch of ideas of ways that we can, you know, again, as I mentioned, you know, the idea of like members growing hops, you know, members, um, members developing recipes, like, you know, as as any member who has an idea of like another thing that the co-op could do that would enhance its values to the members and create a new subgroup of members who have that kind of special relationship in addition to, in addition to the general relationship is, you know, it, it becomes a, a canvas on which the members can, you know, paint their desires and projects. You, you had a question or a comment? I sort of do. Um, maybe this is a misguided question, but perhaps you can clarify. I do charitable co-ops uh, co in which we uh, try to put uh, food for the homeless. It's called Operation Feed the Homeless. And I'm trying to work a little bit more, and uh, I love what you said about the, uh, on the productivity and ritual. And I've noticed that um, when you give them a personal stake in the operation, they're more than ready to help you out. So last time we did uh, sandwiches and health kits, and a lot of people came together. But I want to build more momentum on it. But it's very different to what you're doing because we're not really making things. We're kind of just bringing uh, our own personal energy into it. Mm -hmm. So. What do you suggest as a ritual that I can do that is both charitable and also brings people into productivity? I mean, it's, it sounds like from what, what you guys are doing, um, when you say when you say it's it's a, it's a co-op, is it are you like what like is it something where the like how like can you explain a little bit more about the, the sort of structure? Sure, perhaps I'm using the wrong terminology, but it's just an ad hoc uh, organization of people, and um, it's mostly I guess. We meet at this specific time and place, and we try to get donations from every single uh, member. But the ultimate goal is to build a garden in which people can work into it. But ultimately, the goal is to spread out the food and the charity to others outside of the immediate circle. Uh, am I misguided in that idea, and how can I improve it? So yeah, so so so, the, so you know, the, and this kind of gets into one of the interesting uh, differences between like a co-op and a collective. So like. You know, the co-op, it's, it's sort of a, a formal governance structure, and you sort of have people essentially owning, and you can have various kinds of co-ops. So it would be like a consumer co-op is owned by all the people who buy, versus a worker co-op whose patronage comes from their, their, the, the hours of labor put in. Or a producer or a marketing co-op, where it's really sort of the, the objective is, okay, you all grow things separately, and this is, you know, this is a shared marketing service for everybody. Um, so it, it sounds like the, the project you're talking about is, a little, is kind of more in that sort of informal collective, where you have a goal, yeah, but it's something where, rather than sort of operating sort of a business that it, that exists for ultimately, you know, to kind of create some revenue and and then become self self supporting, it's sort of something that's more purely donation based. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's kind of sort of it sounds sort of like a, an almost food not bombs type. I um, suppose my model. my question more to the point is how can I move from that point mm -hmm. and then continue that momentum where you are. That mm -hmm. is more my question. Okay. Yeah. No. It's. It's it's a so, so something like that where you're really wanting to have a community of people who are consistently contributing to something. It like the the question of like cooking food and growing food and having those kind of small bite sized responsibilities that people can take on over the long term and sort of really have a sense that them stepping back is letting stepping back from that without having finding someone else to cover that responsibility is kind of letting down a community that who's 
um, who they care about and whose esteem matters to them. And so I think that you know it's one of those things where where the, the importance then is building the um, building the opportunities for people to again get to know each other in a way that's a little bit beyond the, the simple project at hand. Although you know something like okay making sandwiches together is is a great way of you know that kind of like shared work. Again, you know, it's like, okay, you know, figure out how people function. But, um, but really for people to kind of have that deeper level of commitment, um, they need to sort of ultimately have, you know, the, you know, the, the carrot of the enjoyment of, you know, being appreciated by the group, but also kind of the stick of, um, of caring enough about the other people you're working with and having enough of a um, personal and trust and kind of like all these, this relationship to, um, to feel bad when you, when you, when you sort of let things slide. And that's sort of the, 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 the carrot and the stick of that, if you can kind of create those opportunities to, for, for people to really get to know and appreciate each other, that becomes a kind of social glue of a project I would like that. Say more carrots. You, you, when you're giving the food out to people, is it a community meal or are you handing out the sandwiches? Certainly, it, well, the way it works out is that uh, when we do have the meals ready, it's, I don't say, well, I'm going to assign you to go this and uh, everywhere, uh, everywhere, people actually come and suggest, well, can I do this? I'm like, certainly, you're in control, you're the leader, you're the one who's supposed to. So, uh, not only are we spreading out pizza, we also uh, we're doing it repeatedly. Uh, lastly, we did uh, pizzas for the homeless. Some of the volunteers decided to even deliver them to other uh, apartments of hotels, like people who were really needy, and they're like really excited because they, they believe that I came up with the idea, and it's like, no, you came up with it. You're the leader here, you're the one who's making the rules. So, and that, I, I, I tried to impart that type of leadership, but at the end, we have this ritual in which, yes, we gave out food to them. Now let's be in communion with each other and have food for everybody yes, else. So I was gonna say, the more the people eat together themselves, too. Yeah. Yes. That helps. It sounds like this initiative you may let yourself and other folks involved in this really benefit from um, like a grassroots organizing training um, like model. Um, and I'm maybe in this region not yeah, familiar with the kind of efforts that may be around, but I don't know what you know. Maybe get Vermont, somebody from Food.com's like in Boston handful. or somebody to come up. Or where, where are you in New Hampshire now? Or? Well, it's, uh, it's flimsy. You never know. Okay. I don't know where I'm going to be. But uh, I, I have you talked to Texas. Food.com's people? Right. 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 No, not yet. I've just do it out of both my own okay. individual initiative. Because right. they have oh, a, they have methods. They, they may have some stuff to share. About organizing. I will look that up. They do yeah. a lot of dumpster diving and stuff, and they have a tradition. So, Jeff, um, at this uh, food co op we organize here, there's a lot of libertarians that just aren't quite familiar with co op principles or like, why would you want to do this thing? I can always go to market basket and buy food, you know? And um, it struck me, and I, I try to explain to them, I said, well, you know, we're, we all put out all this energy in order to move to New Hampshire for this cause, you know? And so if you go to Market Basket, you can go buy food without ever talking to another human being because they have the robo-checkout lines, you can swipe your credit cards through it. And I says, you actually miss out on this huge organizing opportunity that you could have associated with your food, with mm -hmm. purchasing it, consuming it, growing it, all these other aspects of it. And it's, it's like the, the automation of it in grocery shopping is like a disorganizing tool that keeps us from organizing. Right. Because it's, yeah, it's 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 that it's that question of alienation, you know. Yeah. It's, you know, if we can be the the thing that makes movements powerful is really the, the social capital of the you know of the of the well, I mean the aggregate, but also the specific sort of sense of okay, if there's an action, if there's something that needs to be taken, who can be trusted? You know, are there all you know that that kind of gift economy style sort of. Um, debts to each other that aren't quantified, but it's like, I've done you a favor, you've done me a favor, I feel like I can ask you and then you'll sort of owe me late, later, or vice versa, like, that, like all of those networks of kind of reciprocal relationships, um, arts, you know, they, they really sort of, they're not, inherently as human beings, they're not, you know, confined to one realm of action. It's the sort of thing where that sort of cooperating on something that seems, that's on the surface pretty benign, you know, making sure, you know, getting your getting your fresh veggies or you know through the co-op or you know get you know getting, making sure that there's beer for a party every every month. Um, 
is, is something that's ultimately kind of that, that social foundation upon which kind of robust and sus really sustainable movements can be built. Because otherwise, if it's the sort of thing where it's everyone just throwing in work, you're all driv driving towards a goal, and everyone else in the group is really just a means to an end, like that is, that is a recipe for burnout. That's a recipe for this becoming psychologically, organizing becoming psychologically exhausting. And, you know, rather than something that in which you are both recharging and sort of taking advantage of that, what I was talking about earlier, that kind of recuperative space that our society allows us, basically weaponizing it in a way. I, I can't help but feel like um, you've mentioned two things in the last couple of answers. One was in, in his response, or in your response to him about like the carrot and the stick, it's like the stick of, essentially you're talking about like fostering a feeling of guilt to keep people locked into contributing to something, right? And in the second case, you're talking about like a system of debt where people owe each other favors all the time. Mm -hmm. So that that's a little off-putting to me as like, that to me seems psychologically exhausting like being involved in a system that I have to contribute to out of um, avoidance of like negatives of like guilt, you know, avoiding guilt and avoiding and like trying to pay off debt all the time. Does that well, make sense? Well, I think that's, a, so I think the, the debt metaphor is, is a little stretched in that like when thinking about the gift economy, debt is something that's very, that's very different than something in, the, in sort of a cash metered economy. Um, and, and I, I think I think it's the sort of thing where you know debt sort of, or sort of that that guilt and appreciation are two sides of the same coin. You know, in human relationships, like if I do you a solid, I feel appreciation. If I do you a if I like do you a disservice, and we have you know, we have an existing relationship, we're gonna feel guilt. It's not something that's saying like it's, and I mean like the, the other option of between it's either you have both of those or you have an alienated relationship where you and I don't matter to each other. We're strangers, we have something that's maybe entirely mediated by cash or entirely mediated by ideology, but we can treat each other as as um, kind of tools without actually having feelings one way or the other. So I don't feel gratitude for you if you do something nice to me because you're simply, because you can't, or I don't feel sort of bad if I do something, I do something shitty to you. Um, so, so, so I think it's, it's a sort of thing where you can't avoid that if you're going to have these sorts of deeper trust relationships that allow for that kind of level of coordination and action in, a, in kind of a you know, movement or sort of organizing context. Which is kind of like where how people do things work. Isn't that also a follow up of how the creation of money came about, you know, in the olden days? It was that, you know, I like your cow and I would like to use your cow and it will give me a favor for that cow. So in that community, in that community based thing, you were able to repay that favor. It was not necessarily debt, but it was just uh, because you had that very strong human network, you knew that you have to pay into it to power. It, it can take an entirely different form. So it's something where it's like if you're metering that debt and okay this cow is worth five hundred dollars therefore you need to render five hundred dollars worth of something else versus something where there's a certain level of community mediation around um, what is sort of an appropriate payment back and forth that could have a monetary component it could also have a social component you know it's the sort of thing where an elaborate thank you or like something else from someone who maybe doesn't actually have much wealth would within within that community context feel like sort of you know things have been settled equally um, and that, that allows, again, for a lot more flexibility and a lot of actually um, sort of creativity, I think, in a way in which the um, people can, pe where, where people's really sort of gifts to each other um, can take on these unique characteristics that, that are very much influenced by those relationships and ultimately build those relationships. So it's, it's all about kind of that idea, I think, of you know, creating systems of mutual accountability, but, but like not, as, not simply as something that's, uh, you know, I'm being controlled by other people, but that I'm in, I'm in a relationship, there's power in all human relationships, you know, and so is this, but is the power something that's, that's healthy, you know, useful, or is this power something that's sort of unhealthy and repressive or oppressive? Um, I think that sort of these sorts of situations and these sorts of models really, sort of really do a good job of cultivating that, those sorts of healthy power relationships. Yeah?
Yeah, and I mean, wouldn't, it, wouldn't the rest of the group, uh, the rest of the owners of the co-op, understand if you had to take personal time, you just have to meet the pressures and all that, mm -hmm. and rather than feeling guilty or whatever, right. can't it be a welcoming part yeah, of Yeah, yeah, that, that's a life? really good point. It's, it's that question of, uh, and that's actually one, yeah, that's one other thing that the co-op model has historically and powerfully done, is kind of create a space where before, if you sort of see yourselves as two people in this kind of opposing relationship, you know, especially with this kind of economic relationship, um, then there's an incentive on, on both sides to kind of hide, like not be fully honest, you know, try to put your best face forward. Whereas if you can kind of build these sorts of communities, then there's the, the question of, okay, like, you know, there's all sorts of things that would, that would be mitigating factors that other people would recognize. So a great example of this comes from sort of the history of the credit union movement. Um, whereas in early credit unions um, kind of were based on, were small, and kind of their membership was limited to a specific common bond, a specific pre-existing organic community. It could be a workplace, it could be a single church parish, um, it could be like a small neighborhood, but places where people generally knew each other. And they weren't insured, but that actually provided the social sort of connectivity of that community, the social capital of that community provided an incredibly powerful mechanism for um, making credit cheaper. Because on the one hand, it meant that someone who had, you know, things got out of control, they couldn't pay their debts, they went into bankruptcy. Um, if it was a purely oppositional profit relationship that had no community component, the rational thing to do is just be like, I don't have any debts anymore, I went into bankruptcy. But you have all of these records, and I'm I, I got my start in the co-op world and credit union history, so like, you know, there's all these like records of like letters that people who've been, who are part of this community, who had taken out loans and had them written off, still sending like five dollars a month in years later because they felt an obligation, a social obligation to pay off that debt, pay what they could, even though the, the credit union had no expectation of that. And on the flip side, there's plenty of examples of, you know, the, the credit committee sort of going, looking, okay, there's someone who had like a terrible workplace injury or, you know, their, you know their, their, their major wage earning spouse died. Um, you know, let's let's work with these people. Let's either reduce or eliminate or write off that that debt without it becoming something that's a bankruptcy that you know affects their wider standing in the community because that sort of democratically elected from within the community group of people who were generally selected because of their sort of social knowledge and standing within the community had judged this to be kind of a an acceptable re reason to sort of to give leniency on the debt and therefore there'd be no social consequences in that situation for, for that individual. But I mean, the flip side might be that individual like 10 years later is kind of things are back on track and they, they recognize that that was a good debt to them and a hard time by their community and might be paying, would be one of those people still sending in that, that five dollars a month you know 10 years later. So that kind of that sort of that sort of really sort of dense so social capital in a co-op is something that's an incredibly powerful mechanism. We still have 10 minutes, so we can just keep going. Blah, 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 blah. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's something that somebody said earlier um, it's got me thinking, and um, it seems that there are you know, a good amount of people, maybe this event in particular, who um, would see what you described as alienation, as an alienated economic relationship, um, and it's not necessarily something to be wary of, or something that's problematic at all. So, you know, an exchange relationship, let's say, where we don't know each other, and it's like this. Um, so, how would you, from, in your view, what is, uh, what is the harm in organizing our relationships in that way? Um, I, well, I think it, I think it's something it's something that's that's useful for certain realms of activity. You know, it's like for trade over long distances. Like you don't have a complex economy, you need to have that sort of sense of clear accounting and, clear, and sort of accountability in, in many cases. But I think it's it's also something that really um, you know there's it's it's something that it, that I, I see as actually kind of almost um, extractive in a way in that sort of for human society to function and for human beings to sort of have happy lives, that kind of trust thing is really important. You know, we're really trusting each have, having sort of a sense of trust and belonging and all of that. Um, and that sort of trust, that pool of social capital is something that 
uh, needs to be replenished. If you, if you, and this has been, in some ways, in the co-op movement, this is actually an issue where co-ops that, that seem to like be more alienated, that seem to be less and less co-op-y, come from them essentially not reinvesting, not doing, not implementing the sorts of rituals and practices that kind of continuously build that trust. Because it's something that can't be just, okay, now I trust you and I will trust you forever, it's, or I have a relationship. It's human relationships need to be constantly replenished. And so as you have an economy or in a social system, an economy or sort of social world in which an increasing amount of people's lives are lived in that form of alienated relationship, it means that you have um, all of these social problems emerge because there's less and less trust. And people oftentimes in extreme cases, and like you can see this in like some of the social problems in large cities that like are in which the alienation is very intense, um, is that people like don't even learn how to trust each other. And so a lot, so in, in, especially in terms of organizing resistance um, in the face of repression, that kind of trust and that like knowledge of how to build trust is an essential tool. And if you don't have, and if you have a population that doesn't even know how to build those sorts of relationships, they don't have the experience of that anymore. Um, you know, so the, you know, decline of religion. I'm personally not a, not a religious person, but like, you know, the the church is an institution. You know, suddenly, like that's one fewer thing. The the kind of social clubs, like the the, the elders, or you know, that that would be another place where people would learn kind of these, these skills and practice these skills and sort of you know, and, you know, public sort of the way that public schooling is structured is another thing that's still sort of you know, grading, you know, and having kind of being ranked in the classes is another alienating thing. So you have people being put in all of these alienating environments, and they you know, you have a community that's essentially been de-skilled on how to engage in these sort of social, and build these sort of social relationships that are necessary for both pushing back, but also building building a world in which everyone has a sense of ownership and <coughs> equity and, and can have a sense of responsibility rather than it being you know, the only relationship available and that's conceivable to people being something that's oppositional and ultimately zero-sum and exploitative. To, to what you said, uh, I think that you know, existing power structures obviously benefit when people are divided and uh, arguing amongst themselves or not communicating. So like you said earlier, the ability to practice making those trusting relationships and to figure out alternative ways of communicating without the mediation of the existing system and so on allow people to organize against the thing that is causing the alienation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, there's something I've observed in the co-op. I uh, was part of starting that maybe you can comment on. And because I really wanted it to work, you know, I put out a lot of effort and I would do all these presentations about why we should have a co-op. And what then kind after a while, this? Uh, what kind of co-op? A uh, food co-op. It's called the Shire mm -hmm. Co-op. So then I kind of noticed that people, uh, some some of the people, I think in the, the well, they would kind of essentially start referring it to it as Jack's Co-op because I was doing all this work. And I was going like, wait, that's not what we're trying to do. I don't really want to do all the work and own it and make all the decisions. I think I've got some great ideas, but I want to present them to you, you know, for some sort of consensus. Mm -hmm. So I actually think it's due to the fact that, that most people do work in higher oh, totally. structures and they can't even free their mind from that. And they're still thinking, okay, this Co-op has a boss. That, yeah, oh, totally. And I mean, that's actually something that even in terms of management of co-ops, so this whole kind of like question of social capital of co-ops is, is a hugely powerful tool if you know how to use it. But especially in the credit union movement, um, which has kind of degenerated substantially with, except, with some exceptions, um, the, even the, the management comes in and they've been taught how to run a for-profit business. And in a for-profit business, community building is not a major activity, is not a source of value, is not a sort of, you know, so, and so they, that just is neglected, and then that creates this this um, cycle of okay, so you're not reinvesting in building the social capital of the community. You have fewer people involved in governance. You can have management capture happen, and then it basically becomes a demutualized and turns into that kind of more traditional corporate form, um, authoritarian hierarchical corporate form. And so, yeah, and I think that's the thing. It's again sort of the the question of why, you know. For, for me as an organizer, sort of organizing sort of a brewing co-op, is it's an opportunity for taking advantage of that space created by, you know, people people wanting to participate, wanting to be involved in something that's kind of in this recuperative space, um, 
in order for people to start internalizing that idea that it's not Jack's co-op or it's not Matt's co-op. You know, I have an equal say, I have an equal sort of vote and voice, and if I have a suggestion, it's mine just as much as, as theirs. In that sort of sense, and that's the thing is that, that people have a sense of kind of uh, what ownership is, it's usually something that's very narrow. And learning how to operate in a, in a system in which a lot of people have a piece of the ownership in our peers is, is a completely different form of social relationship that needs practice in order to actually really understand how it works. And I think one of the things that's, that's kind of interesting is in terms of organizing somewhere like northern New England or most other places is most people in northern New England have the experience of town meeting. And so when talking about, say, something as simple as like the annual meeting of a co-op, you know, that's an alienate, that's a scary thing, concept for a lot of people. They don't know what to, what they, most people don't have a sense of like what it is to like actually go through one of these meetings anymore. But in, at least in sort of this region of the country, the t town meeting kind of has provided that baseline so there's a larger segment of the population that has these skills already than in most other places where you don't even have that as a, um, as a, as a sort of field of practice. Right. Training ground. Mm -hmm. Totally. And that's the thing, is it's like it's not going to be something where you can just you know, read a little pamphlet and then you have all these skills instantly. It's a lot about confidence and practice and knowing kind of the rituals of when to speak up and when to you know, step back from, from, uh, the, from engagement and you know, what those roles really are. And it's made even harder by the fact that a lot of the, these existing co-ops, like these credit unions, you know, the member does try to assert their um, their their, their, role, their ownership role from something that where management has basically captured the organization, they don't even know how to deal with that. It's, you know, it's like, oh, I want to volunteer. What? But, but we don't volunteer? We don't have to take volunteer. But you're, you're it's volunteer board of directors. Uh, you know, the co-ops are supposed to be able to sort of do that. So, so, it's, so it's something where that's kind of a struggle in existing co-ops. And so again, this sort of brew, brewery co-op has almost this kind of foundation for more broad co-op organizing. Kind of uses the people's recuperative attachment to you know, drinking craft beer as a way of bringing people into developing those skills that can be transferred across. The one thing I can conclude from your talk is that we didn't serve enough alcohol at the meeting. So. <laughs> Oh, I should have brought a cake. <laughs> no, 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 I mean, at the co-op meeting, you know. Yeah, 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 no, it's... I was probably too much all business, you know, when I was trying to introduce the concept. Yeah, I mean, like, with this thing, you know, it's, you have a natural, again, that natural flow of, you know, get together, have the pot brewing and boiling in one corner, and people, you know, barbecuing and chatting and having a few beers, and, you know, it's, it's something that's pleasurable that people can look forward to rather than seeing it as an obligation. Any other thoughts before we uh, break for the next thing? What is the next thing? I thought I was coming here for the tiny house lecture because that's what's on the Google calendar. But I was planning to come into your thing too. I just had it on my, my schedule at 7 p.m. like Google <laughs> says. I haven't seen one of those three ones yet. I haven't seen one of those. Here, there's a couple of them. Thanks. All right, well then, without further ado, I shall see the floor.